Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Shaheen Chahan and I'll be helping uh, host today's call. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by two of our uh, energy experts, Chris Pascal, who I think you've, uh, many of you who have attended some of our previous webinars have had the, uh, have the pleasure of listening to. Uh, Chris is our Group VP for Energy and uh, as well as being our Head of Global Refining Research. Also, for the first time, we've now, we're, I'm delighted to be joined by um, David Elpers. Uh, David is uh, part of our energy group, uh, which specifically supports our trading uh, energy community of end users. Now, in terms of the agenda, uh, we'll be taking a look at the current top line trends which are shaping the global refining capital spending market. And we're going to be taking a particular look at where new refining capacity investment uh, is playing out right now over the next couple of years. And obviously how that new capacity as it builds out, how that is affecting the uptake of crude right now. Now we're also going to be taking a closer look at activity, particularly in the US Gulf Coast, and how the investments that we're seeing there sit in context of the investment levels that are being tracked elsewhere in the world. Now, before we start the discussion, uh, I thought it'd be useful just to spend a few seconds highlighting the methodology that's going to be underpinning the numbers that you're going to be seeing today. The analysis and the data that the two guys are going to be presenting is a bottom-up assessment of the current and the projected potential pipeline of investment spending and new capacity development that is uh, derived directly from our project and our unit databases. Now, our researchers continuously track and monitor investment activity across the life cycle of a refinery from those very big billion dollar grassroot projects into those unit additions and the expansions right through to the smaller implant capital projects. Our researchers are also tracking activity across maintenance activity, be that the, the, the planned turnarounds and maintenance programs or indeed the unplanned events. Uh, and Dave in particular is going to be talking and touching on some of those turnaround numbers uh, quite shortly. Now, how do we manage to do all of this? Well, as you can see on, the, on this map, we have research teams which are across most of the major refining and energy markets, uh, and you can see where those offices are by those small little round flags. Now, uh, it's through these offices that we can see the geographical location, those hot spots uh, that are associated with this, the, 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 some 586 billion of active refining spending uh, and new capacity development. So, Chris, moving swiftly on, if I could now bring you into the discussion uh, and hand over. We have just uh, short of $100 billion of refining spending, which has come to a construction start. But can you just give us some top-line numbers? How does the looking pipeline present itself right now? Yes, so thanks for the introduction, Shaheen. So if you, if you know, obviously um, you have about a little short of $100 million in, that, in true under construction right now, but looking into the future, not only in the, the, the next two years or the next two years, but also into really our entire database out to 2030, um, there's a lot of activity that's occurring. So the next two years, uh, the total, um, both what we call the planning, you know, projects that are in the planning or in, in the engineering stage, you have about $257 billion of activity uh, that we're tracking right now. And when you look at that from a regional perspective, um, you look at uh, Southeast Asia, who has majority of the spend at $61 billion, followed by East Asia as well as North America. But if you were to widen that net out a little bit and look out in the entire database, look at how far we go out and the projects that we're actually uh, covering and capturing right now, there's a little over $500 billion worth of activity uh, represented through 5,400 individual projects. So the cast is very, very big right now. Uh, we obviously know not a lot of these, um, not every single project will come to fruition, um, but we can certainly narrow that um, the pipeline down and really look at the next two to three years and see what uh, might have a, a higher probability moving forward. Now, um, I'd like to introduce David Elpers, who's one of our senior account um, sales managers, as well as an analyst uh, within the IRNG uh, portfolio as well. David 
we've seen a lot of act, a lot of changes and a lot of activity in the petroleum refining world over the last probably five to ten years. We also see some changes um, with pipelines as well. Can you perhaps um, provide more clarity and details of perhaps some changes, um, uh, both short term and long term? Uh, yeah, certainly, Chris, and and happy to be here. Um, when I look at our long term spending numbers on refineries, um, particularly in the capital space where we're building new units throughout the world, I like to take a step back and say, okay, why? What justifies this? Um, why are we growing at such a, a rapid rate in the refining space? Um, the economy can be pointed to one thing. We expect more economic growth. That's great. But we still need to find the crude oil to fill those new refineries, the new refinery capacity. Uh, the low-hanging fruit there would be to say, well, you know, Saudi Arabia can, can pump more oil. Uh, OPEC can pump more oil. But recent policy from OPEC has said, you know, they're, they're comfortable with the price at about this range, and they're going to moderate how much oil they pump as to not flood the market. But uh, after a couple election cycles here in both uh, the United States and in Canada, um, there have been two strokes of, of the proverbial pen, so to speak, that have really changed in what I believe is the global marketplace for crude oil. And those have been pipeline um, approvals. Uh, two very important pipeline approvals up in Canada. One um, is the Trans Mountain expansion that will send oil to the west coast of Canada. Uh, there's also a pipeline, the Line 3 replacement, that will uh, increase flows into the United States from Canada. On top of that, the very well-known Keystone XL has now been approved by our new president. Uh, that will bring more Canadian oil down to the Gulf Coast as well as the Dakota Access Pipeline up in the northern Midwest in the United States will bring even more oil to the Gulf Coast. Um, in summary, what this means to me uh, is that uh, as we look both in the long term, once these pipelines are constructed, there might be an appetite for a Canadian crude oil barrel in the global marketplace. So as we talk about global refinery capacity expansions, yeah, perhaps we could see that Canadian barrel make its way to the east in some of this new refinery construction. Um, the story isn't just about uh, crude oil capacity growth, though, throughout the world. There's also quite a bit of the numbers that Chris mentioned in our project spending that are being spent to clean up the uh, refining capacity that currently exists throughout the world. So as we move forward in the long term, the focus will, will remain on cleaner, uh, more efficient transportation fuels. And because of that, I want to touch on some of the construction that we see in that space. But the long term is just what it is. It's in the long term. It's not here. It's not today. So what do these spending numbers mean today for you guys on this call? Um, well, in the United States and Canada, there actually is money being spent in the refinery space, uh, it overwhelmingly, though, is not being spent on new construction, new refining uh, barrels, um, rather mostly on crude slate changes to be able to accept some of the landlocked crudes that have become popular in the states uh, over the last five years. And as, uh, as Shaheen pointed out on one of the earlier slides, there is there's constantly money being spent in the turnaround space. Um, it fluctuates a great deal, though, and I want to take a take a look at short-term turnarounds um, as, and the implications uh, for the long-term market for what crude oil could possibly do, um, making its way to the water. So when we step back, we take a very high-level view of our own project research. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that we do track it from three phases. Uh, a planning phase where a lot of these projects are um, going through the permitting phase and really just just ideas at this point in time by some of these larger companies. Um, then we move it through to the engineering phase when the projects really get going, uh, have a, highly, a very high likelihood of being constructed. And then once these projects uh, move into the construction phase, the, the likelihood of them coming to completion grows even more. 
So this is a, a very high level view of crude units, so atmospheric distillation capacity growth going back to 2010 and looking forward to 2020. Pay attention for now to the black line, the net growth line, and you can see that from 2010 to 2016, net growth has been about 500,000 barrels per day of new CDU capacity growth. Um, in some years, the additions to capacity have been matched by shutdowns. These shutdowns have happened primarily in Europe and the Caribbean as uh, the need for refining in those regions has, has decreased due to economic reasons or in the Caribbean um, due to uh, some, po some political issues uh, with ownership of, of refineries down there in the Caribs. But you could see probably that that yellow bar is, uh, is quite shocking. And you might be saying, hey, are we going to really see 7 million barrels per day of new CDU capacity growth throughout the world in 2020? Probably not. Um, that's, that's a bit of a wild card. Um, like I said, those are in the permitting phase, that's in the planning phase, and, and might not ever come to fruition. This chart isolates just the, uh, what is under construction and engineered and paints a, a little better picture, but you can see that the net change does creep up to about 2 million barrels per day in 2019. So there is significant CDU capacity growth on the horizon. And where is that going to come from? Uh, primarily, the orange bars on this chart, as you can see, Asia. Uh, I don't think this is much of a surprise to anyone on this call as uh, particularly Chinese refinery growth is, is growing at a rapid pace to meet the economic needs of that region. Uh, so by 2019, uh, a, a very large portion of the growth that we expect is coming from Asia. But what I like to point out on this particular slide is that by 2020, we do expect over 500,000 barrels of refinery capacity growth in Africa. <clears throat> and um, alluding back to the prior slide with the, the giant yellow bars that reached nearly 7 million barrels a day, I think a lot of that potential planned project activity does come from Africa. And that's a, a region that we're watching very close as we are tracking projects throughout the world. Will these projects ever kick off in Africa? Um, I think 2020 is going to be a good barometer for us as a company to help us to help us better understand what the appetite for for projects not just in the refining space but throughout all industrial construction you know what is that appetite in Africa and and will Africa start start making a move into um, you know into the global economy not only though are we tracking uh, <clears throat> crude unit expansions, as I mentioned. Um, but the world is also trying to make an effort to uh, continue to destroy the heavy crude oil barrels that might come from Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, kind of a lesser grade crude oil, uh, and turn that into transportation fuels. You could throw some of the Canadian barrels into that discussion as well. And the way that refineries need to do this is by adding upgrading units. A couple of the upgrading units that I will discuss here are cokers, which use very, very high heat, very high pressure to destroy what we call the bottom of the barrel and turn it into things like gasoline. Um, coker capacity growth, again, we see on the left-hand side of this slide, the orange bars represent Asia. And we do expect quite a bit of coker growth in Asia between 2016 and 2018. But compared to the prior chart, there's quite a few more colors to be, to be simple, meaning that coker expansions are occurring throughout the world, not just in the developing economies. And this indicates to me that the established economies where we might not see new crude unit capacity growth, we will see a continued focus on upgrading unit projects in an effort to get the <clears throat> to get the most out of 
the entire barrel of crude oil and to do it in the cleanest way we possibly can. The chart on the right there just gives a snapshot of, of where the coking capacity in the, <clears throat> in the world resides at the moment. A lot of people like to think that Pad 3, or the Gulf Coast of the United States, is the global chief of uh, coking capacity. And while global capac or coking capacity in Pad 3 comes in at about 1.5 million barrels per day, you can see down there in North Asia that uh, there's about a million more barrels per day of coking capacity in Asia than there is in Pad 3. So when we take a quick look at that on the right, we see that, hey, increased oil, even if that increased oil is of the heavy, dirty, um, cheap, if you want to call it that, uh, crude, there is a home for it, and, and it's probably going to move overwhelmingly to the east. The hydrocracker growth that we're tracking is, is very similar to the prior slide. We do see a lot of hydrocracking capacity, and again, the hydrocracker is mostly designed to produce a, an increased amount of diesel fuel out of the refinery. So we are seeing uh, hydrocracker capacity growth in Asia, but also we're seeing uh, Europe, uh, the gray portion of these bars, and increase their hydrocracking capacity in a major way as the desulfurization of the world, and particularly diesel fuel throughout the world, um, continues. And that's been an ongoing trend for, for the most of the last decade. The chart on the right here just is a quick snapshot again of, of where the hydrocracking capacity exists worldwide. Um, I would say the only real difference between this and the last one is that the Mediterranean, Northwest Europe, and Eastern Europe uh, occupy a bigger chunk of, of this slide when compared to the prior. Thanks, Dave. So that's a, a really great perspective on the long term of um, adding new CDU capacity as well as upgrading capacity. Now changing a little bit of the focus to the short term, I'm looking at cap, um, CapEx so it's mainly in the, um, the U.S., uh, especially on the Gulf Coast. If you look at project spending over the last seven to ten years, um, you know the, the spending, the um, uh, the purpose of the spending has changed uh, of somewhat. So if you go back um, really um, to the 2007 through 2000, probably 10, 11, 12 timeframe, there was um, a significant amount of projects uh, on the uh, that took place to add new crude capacity, uh, adding new um, you know either increase metal barrels or significant expansion um, to really um, to process um, a lot of um, the Canadian barrels that came down, that were coming down, but also here along the Gulf Coast to perhaps switch a little bit of the, of the, the crude slate. More short term, if you look at the last couple of years, and here on, the, on the bottom of this um, the slide is some of the, the projects that are, that are occurring last year as well as this year. A lot of those projects were really targeted for what I would call crude slate flexibility or optionality. It really didn't add any significant capacity to the processing of the refinery, but it was really to give them more flexibility in terms of the diet the refinery could process, and thus hopefully uh, reducing their cost of their feedstock. Uh, the most recent trend of the last uh, several years has really been to add condensate splitters especially on the Gulf Coast. Um, so we've seen uh, several of those come online, and there's still several that are being planned. Uh, but that's probably the most recent trend to actually to process some of that uh, the crude barrels that David mentioned earlier um, along the Gulf Coast. Now switching gears a little bit, moving, um, David mentioned the moving into the turnarounds and how that might influence the appetite for oil for a short term. Dave, in looking at this slide, um, you can obviously pad two, looking to the future, um, certainly doesn't look like it's going to be comparable to the previous year. Um, can you provide a little bit more details on that? Yeah, certainly. And this is where, in my opinion, 
the the long term and the short term um, match up, and it it becomes very interesting here in the in the next few quarters um, this coming fall, next spring, the following fall, to see where all the crude oil barrels that I mentioned earlier, the new ones coming from Canada through Keystone XL through the Dapple pipeline, they're going to make their way into the Midwest, which is Pad Two. And what will the appetite for these Pad 2 refiners be for this increased flow of oil? Um, if we look to this fall, it's, I'll start by typically saying, saying that typically there's a spring maintenance season and a fall maintenance season for refineries. Uh, if we look on the left-hand side of this chart with the solid lines and the uh, orange dots, it's a very low spring turnaround season. Um, unlike what we saw in the spring of 2016 or the fall of 2015. Um, what we've seen in the corresponding crude throughput numbers from the Department of Energy is that crude runs in Pad 2, again, in the Midwest, have been very high right now. So, in other words, the Midwest is consuming a lot of oil. Um, we like to talk in, in hyperbole sometimes, but we're, we're very nearing all-time high crude throughput numbers for this time of the year. As we look ahead to, to the fall, uh, we're expecting the fall season to be mostly average. Um, these are our planned forecasted numbers. There will surely be more unplanned numbers that could potentially lift the fall season up to an above average year. Um, but for right now, the major Refineries that we do see coming offline are Sicko Lamont, CVR Wynwood, Holly Frontier Tulsa, P66 Ponca City. And the wild card in, in the Midwest this fall, um, as we track these projects, we are tracking the major turnarounds per unit. Um, the refineries I mentioned earlier, we have identified a crude unit that will receive maintenance. Um, the bottom section of, of refineries on this list is where we have identified upgrading unit work at a hydro treater, hydro cracker, perhaps a coker, but have not identified any knock-on impact to the crude unit yet. But when these very big hydro treaters, cokers, etc., when they come offline, it will likely slow crude runs uh, at the headline level at the refinery. All in all, this is saying that this fall, the expectation should be for about average, um, when, we compare, when we compare historically, average to slightly above average crude runs with a risk that these upgrading unit turnarounds could drop crude throughput slightly. Pad 3, however, uh, is, is a bit of a different story. We saw a fairly significant turnaround season this spring. But for those of you that do watch the, the statistics provided by the Department of Energy, you'll see that Pad 3 crude run numbers that were released on Wednesday were sky high. Very high crude run numbers in Pad 3 that were a result of some low turnarounds coming out of the spring turnaround season. So the appetite for crude oil in Pad 3 today, this week, as I'm giving this uh, presentation, has never been higher. As we move through the summer, you see that the forecast for turnarounds, again, these are planned turnarounds in Pad 3, the forecast, the expectation is very low. And as we move into the fall season, the forecast is for below average, below last year, certainly below 2015 as well, turnaround activity. There are some refineries that will be in turnaround, Port Arthur, Sicko Lake Charles, Western El Paso, and a couple others on the list. And again, we do expect upgrading unit turnarounds to occur at Valero, Houston, Valero McKee and Total Port Arthur. And again, there will be unplanned turnarounds that come up along the way. 
hopefully no hurricanes this year, but that would be a good example of, of an unplanned situation that might happen in pad three. But the takeaway from this slide is that right now we have very high crude runs in pad three along the Gulf Coast of, of the United States. And as we look forward to this fall season, that trend should continue. We should continue to see very high crude takeaway numbers. So where does that leave us in the context of this conversation? Well, right now, crude runs, U.S. crude throughput is very high, as I mentioned. As we move through the summer, we should see very high utilization rates, crude throughput rates in both pads two and pad three. This fall could see a slight dip in throughput in pad two. Um, but we do expect pad three crude runs to remain elevated. All in all, this is a way of saying that the normal seasonal dip that we see in the fall, we could see that the, uh, the orange line there could steamroll right through that dip and provide us with some all-time high crude run numbers for, for the late September, October, early November months. So the appetite for crude oil from the refinery level in the United States uh, should come from the Gulf Coast and potentially pad two this fall. But with the increased crude oil pipeline connectivity coming from Canada, there is a potential for there to be even more oil in the Gulf Coast than these refineries can even consume. So from a long-term perspective, kind of these are my final thoughts on, on, uh, on the topic. From a long-term perspective, we do expect significant refinery growth throughout the world. Um, we're tracking these projects from the CDU level, from the crude unit level, as well as the upgrading side. In the short term, we expect very high utilization rates and low turnaround activity in North America in the very short term. Where I think this all gets very interesting is as these pipelines coming from Canada through the United States are constructed, as they begin to, to get filled, will the sort of North America domestic refining market be enough to consume the extra barrels that are coming from these regions? Where the, will there be enough capacity? And uh, in the long and short of it, I, I, I don't think so. I think what we'll see as we move forward with the uh, allowance of crude oil exports out of the United States, we will start to see that this pipeline connectivity will result in a bypass of sorts of the U.S. refining industry and these North American crude oils that production is expected to continue to rise will find themselves in locations that they've never seen before, maybe in the east. So that's where the long and the short will come together uh, and I'm, I'm very interested to see how this all plays out. Okay, I think that brings us to the end of the discussion uh, and the webinar. Many thanks, guys, to both you, uh, Chris, and, and Dave. Many thanks for sharing your thoughts uh, and perspectives. Very interesting. Now, for those uh, on today's call, you can get a copy of this webinar online, and you can do that via our portal. Or alternatively, you can reach out to our energy team or directly to Chris Pascal. Um, to get a copy or find out a little bit more around some of the data that we're tracking and some of the projects and turnaround activity that, uh, that the team are both mon monitoring. Uh, and with that, I'd just like to say a final thank you to those who've attended. Big thank you to you, Chris, Dave. Uh, and with that, I'd just like to bid everybody a goodbye. <laughs>